Twas the show before Christmas, when all through the house, no hardware was glowing, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the PC with care, in the hopes that Mark Shuttleworth soon would be there. Presenters nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of 1004 danced in their heads, and Popey in his nightgown and Dave in his cap, we just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter, when what to my wondering eyes should appear but a Russian soyuz and eight eager reindeer. With a dashing young driver so full of largesse, I knew in a moment it must be Mark S. His reindeer charged onwards, their eyes all aflame, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Castro, now Holbeck, now Remnant and Bacon, on Language, on Spencer, on Zimmerman and Watson. Let's make this distro its users enthrall, find Bugs and Ubuntu, we must solve them all. He sprang to his capsule, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Welcome to the final episode of season two of the Ubuntu UK podcast. We're here with mince pies and mulled wine to celebrate it being Christmas. And it's Monday the 21st of December. In this episode we're going to play the final interview from UDS, which is with Steve Spurley from Freescale. We'll do the typical end of year wrap up with our thoughts about next year. And we will of course cover the latest news, events, ecosphere and feedback. I'm Laura and this week with me are... A pretty much empty house. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot of mince pies. Yeah. We, Yippee. I think we're up to the job, though. So I'm Tony. I'm Simon. And where are the other two? They couldn't be bothered. Yeah. <laughs> something, something about a couple of flakes of snow fell, and that was it enough, apparently. It was just too much for them. Dave's car packed in. Driving it far too fast and yeah. blew his turbo up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I think Alan just fancied an evening at home with his feet up. It's just too cold out. Just too cold. Anyway, um, so what have you been doing, Laura? Uh, I've installed Karmic Fresh on my work laptop. Karmic Fresh? <laughs> Karmic. <laughs> I freshly. Fresh, I freshly installed Karmic on my work laptop and it mostly seems to work. I can't play media very well on it. And then I upgraded my home laptop, which I've upgraded twice, I think now, to Karmic. And that again seems to be fine. I haven't tried sound or anything on it yet. Oh, but both the upgrades or the reinstalls went all right? Mm, the actual upgrade and reinstall both went fine. Excellent. And did you do the upgrade using the upgrade GUI tool thing? Uh, yes, I think so. But using our mirror, app mirror. Yeah. Okay, cool. What about you, Simon? Um, I just had a week off work. That sounds nice. Which was very nice. But, so um, you've been doing computer stuff for the whole week? I've been sat at my laptop all week. Um, at the beginning of the week, the guys at uh, Lug.org UK oh, right. um, needed a bit of work doing. And I said, well, I've got a week off. Um, <laughs> what do you want doing? So I've been madly um, at the command line after the last episode saying I wanted to get away from the command yeah. line and use the GUI. I've just been mad on the command line for the last week, getting in and um, working on on the domain, on the servers, and getting the work backload sorted. So you've been doing a lot of system administration stuff? Yeah, and doing things that I never normally do, sort of uh, user mod type stuff and okay. restricting access to um, different home paths and SCP only rather than full shell access. Cool. So people, who, people who've been had some requests that have been a bit of a backlog and you've kind of been working your way through them. Yeah, the problem with obviously the organisation is it's all volunteers and mm. um, yeah, everybody's busy Yeah, um, and it just gets missed uh, and there's been a bit of a backlog so I've been clearing it. And hopefully, by the end of the holidays, it will all be gone. Excellent. Well, that'll be a happy New Year present for <laughs> for the good denizens of Log.org.uk, yeah. I'm sure. What about you, mate? Have you been busy? Yeah. Um, I've well, I passed my second essay. Yay! Well, um, so there's only uh, seven more to go, one of which is due in just after Christmas. But, you know, let's not worry so about that today. Fun um, yeah. sat typing. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, But I've just started work on the Lug Radio Live videos from October as well. How's that going? Um, it, it's it's going well, actually. Um, a few audio problems. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, I'm trying to remember my way through the workflow of getting them all done and, and 
what I do with to get them there and put the slides in and everything. But it's the first time I've used the newer versions of, of things like KDN Live um, that are in uh, you know, Karmic. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I get into to use some of the new features there and find what's changed and what have you. Um, but, yeah. Have you good. got a deadline for that? Or are you just uh, going to get it done when it's done? Um, just when it's done. Okay. Just when it's done. Um, I'll do all the talk ones first. And I think John is working on the audio of the live show. So once that's out, I can do the video version. Cool. But, yeah, that's all good fun. Um, but, yeah. So we should actually say that this is the last episode of this season. Um, so we will be back in the new year in um, sort of February, March time, a couple of months off. And... Uh, this is your notice. Please pay attention. Because last, <laughs> last time we ended the season, we said right at the very end of the episode, I don't think people listen all the way through, <laughs> and they missed it, and they sent us a lot of emails saying, when are you coming back? So yeah, last episode of the season, alert, a wooga, a wooga. <laughs> Come back and listen to us in February or use the RSS feed. Anyway, so it sounds like a fun pa- last episode. <laughs> okay, I'm here with uh, Steve Spurley from Freescale. Can you tell us a little bit about what Freescale does and where we will have heard of you and what you guys do? Sure. Um, Freescale is a semiconductor manufacturer, and that's commonly called chips. We make chips that go into uh, uh, various uh, electronic devices that people use. Most of our uh, chips are very uh, useful in devices like cars and uh, networking. You know, cars like Ford, for instance, use uh, the SYNC methodology to be able to speak to the system and have it tell you directions and such. That's based on the Freescale out of MX31 processor. We also create uh, chips that are used in the backbone to run the internet. Uh, Cisco uses a, a lot of our chips, so almost all of your web browsing passes through a Freescale chip at one time. And then we also create devices that are used in industrial dev- industrial products and home appliances like uh, refrigerators, washers, and dryers. And then, again, the part that I'm involved in is wh- uh, what we call consumer products um, for smart books, and those are uh, specifically devices that are uh, similar to notebook computers and similar to uh, smartphones, but they kind of fall in between there. They're a little bit uh, bigger than a smartphone and have better resolution than a smartphone, uh, but in terms of uh, comparison to a netbook computer, they have longer battery life and uh, faster response in terms of instant on. So it's uh, that's the area that I look at. And in terms of those smart books, are they um, based on Intel architect- Intel style architecture? Or are they completely different architecture? Will they run uh, software that people are familiar with, or completely different software? Well, the the architecture itself is based on the ARM. Uh, intellectual property and Freescale takes that and and creates a chip on it. In terms of the software, uh, the examples of software are Ubuntu for one and then all the applications that go on Ubuntu, uh, Linux and we support uh, other uh, environments also. Some of our devices, as I mentioned, the Ford Sync happens to use uh, some Microsoft software and uh, there are other uh, instantiations where there's real-time operating systems but uh, uh, the you know, software is beautiful in that you can use it to, to do anything that you want. And uh, one of the partners that we work with very closely is uh, Canonical with their Ubuntu um, Linux distribution. And that's the primary one that we introduced when we first entered the smart book market was uh, the Ubuntu. And is that available on a on a device now? Can I, can I you know, buy a device that has uh, Ubuntu pre-installed? Well, the first uh, smart book device introduced in the world was actually from Sharp. They introduced it in August of uh, 2009 of this year and uh, announced it then, and they started shipping it in September. So that device is available in um, Japan. Um, I'm hoping that it will be available in other uh, locations, but I don't have dates for that yet. There are other devices that Freescale and other companies that Freescale is working with that will be announcing uh, products and having them be available, uh, I hope, uh, later this year, but for certain early 2010. And one of the the things that a lot of people are after in their, their smart book or netbook style device is that panacea of having something that has a battery life that lasts almost forever and um, excellent computing power and the ability to play videos. And can, can we see those kind of things delivered with Freescale architecture? Well, that's one of the main strengths of our uh, chip is that we've designed it from the ground up to be a battery-operated device. 
and it, in addition to having a very high performance ARM based processor, we also have uh, coprocessors uh, that can be used to provide outstanding performance and accelerate uh, graphics, 2D graphics and 3D graphics and also video, uh, movies um, and uh, run those at high performance but also at very low power consumption. In fact when you're running a video the CPU, uh, the processor, CPU portion of the processor essentially goes to sleep because all the hard work is being done by the video uh, coprocessor. So we can have very long uh, battery life when you're playing a video, but also because it's specifically designed to do video decode, you get st fabulous video decoding uh, capabilities. So it is the best combination of those two worlds, great performance and long battery life. And so at the moment we're looking at the, is it uh, the ARM Cortex-8 kind of reference design, or are we, are we looking beyond that next year to, to other uh, more powerful um, different designs? Well, the devices that are being introduced this year are based on the A8. Mm -hmm. um, so, and that's perf performing very well for us. We, we uh, are very happy with that, and we'll have additional devices that come out based on A8 uh, next year, and then you'll also see eventually uh, a 9 uh, type devices, but we're not announcing anything specifically today about that. Okay, and you have a partnership with with Canonical. Does that mean you're you're providing hardware to Canonical for their developers to to work on to get the best out of the hardware with with our software? So uh, exactly, uh, we uh, first engaged with Canonical uh, in 2008. So we've been working with Canonical for over a year now. We provided them with hardware ever since then. That's one of the key requirements for them. For Canonical to do any work is they have to have a, a hardware platform. And Freescale as a function of a, our deliverable, in addition to hardware, we provide a board support package. So the initial load of software with the drivers that give you access to the uh, various uh, coprocessors is a deliverable from Freescale to Canonical. So we want to make sure that you get the very best uh, possible uh, performance and power management there and we use our experts in those fields to deliver those drivers to uh, Canonical as a base that Canonical then adds the Ubuntu distribution on top of and takes advantage of those uh, accelerators. And another device that I've seen, you mentioned the Sharp device, another one that's been seen around the place is the, the Pegatron um, device. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the specification on that device and uh, uh, what it's capable of? Sure, the Sharp is called the NetWalker PC-Z1. Uh, it was the one that was announced in uh, August and started shipping in September. It has a 5-inch touch screen on it with a very high resolution, uh, 1024 by 600. And uh, in addition, it has, uh, you know, that 5-inch form factor is very pocketable. And it has, it's a clamshell form factor, so you've got a screen, the touch screen, plus a, a keyboard. It's more... I guess a thumb board because of the size and it is set up so you can very easily use it with two hands instead of using a ten finger typing you use your thumb typing like you would on a Blackberry or some other type of uh, cell phone based uh, keyboard uh, so it's very appropriate for doing email and texting and um, I think it's a really uh, uh, great form factor sense from the standpoint of it's very easy to carry with you and has a great battery life with it, but it's got a, a screen resolution on it that allows you to do real web browsing and to get a, a great movie playback experience at the same time. And it's a full desktop operating system rather than being a limited mobile device that you, that you might have a limited platform on a mobile, for example. Precisely. It is the Ubuntu uh, distribution uh, customized by uh, Canonical for um, uh, Sharp, just like they do for other uh, major OEMs. And so we're looking at more devices, more netbooks, more smartbooks in beginning part of 2010? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Excellent. Okay, well, we'll look forward to that. Thanks That's for fine. talking to us. You're more than welcome. It's my pleasure. Here are some news and some events. Mark Shuttleworth is stepping down as Canonical CEO from March next year to concentrate on design and usability aspects of Ubuntu. Current COO Jane Silber will take over as CEO. Yeah, quite a big news uh, article this one. Hmm. Hmm. Good thing or a bad thing? Simon, you look sceptical. I'm sceptical. I don't believe that um, she's going to have much fun, to be honest. He, he's, he is 
the main man. I'm sure he will watch over her and, and micromanage her. I can't believe he's going to step aside completely and then a crack on. But I read the article and it says about how there'd be a smooth transition and I kind of suspect that maybe that's the way they're working already. Yeah, I, I get that impression. I mean, she's in charge of the day-to-day operations anyway, Jane. Yeah, he'll do the sort of the interesting fun bits as they come along. That's his... And I guess when you've got that amount of money, it's your prerogative, exactly. really. I mean, he's not, certainly not sort of handing over ownership of the company, so he still have, you know, ownership type control. Just Big not... screwdriver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, no, so that's from March, as I say, in March next year, isn't it? Um, quite a big change. I suppose it'll be good. I mean, he's obviously feeling restricted by his position, and he mm. just wants to sort of get back into the guts of it and, um, and make change and make sure that the T-shirts are the right colour and stuff. Yeah, which is fair enough. <laughs> The Software Freedom Law Centre has filed lawsuits against 14 technology companies claiming they violated the GPL by including the BusyBox software in their devices without offering access to the source code. The companies named include Samsung, JVC and Busy, uh, Best Buy. Um, Busy, Best Buy, BusyBox, that's the one. Um, however, open source developer Bruce Perrins claims he holds the copyright of most of the code in the disputed versions of BusyBox and was not consulted by the SFLC about the suit. Interesting. This is another one of those... GPL test cases that everybody gets very excited about and usually ends up being settled out of court before it comes to trial. Yeah, I mean, what's the, I know the way the GPL describes that they must provide the source code with it. But mm. I suppose if there's no reference to it, you know, you can go and get the source code over there rather than here it is. Well, most people yeah. just stick it on their website. Yeah. That's what com- some companies like Sony and stuff do. They've just got a, an open source code page and anybody who gets the TV with something embedded, it'll say in the back of the manual, go to this URL to get the source code if you want to. And nobody really um, worries about it because that meets the terms of the GPL. So it's a fairly low overhead thing for companies to do. The code of a collaborative web-based real-time text editor, Etherpad, has been released under the Apache license and been bought by Google. Not a bad day's work. Yeah. It's been promised to have released for a while, I think, and they've, they've sort of finally got it out yeah, there. It. Yeah. What is it? It's um, a collaborative web-based real-time text <laughs> editor. So it's like multiplayer notepad. Oh, okay. Like Gobby. Yeah, a bit like Gobby, but in a web-based form. Oh, right. Sorry, yeah. Okay. So you give somebody a, a URL to a unique pad, I guess, and anybody can just join in. They sort of identify your contributions by colour. Very much like Gobby, but on the web. Cool. It is. It's useful. You should try it sometime, Tony. I have tried Etherpad. Have you? Yeah. But apparently um, it's a bit of a conflict with the people behind Wave, of course, because it's a similar collaborative platform. Um, So I'm not quite sure what will happen with that in the future. I think the difference between Wave and Etherpad is that with Wave, you've got to go through all the noise of getting a Wave account and getting Mm. um, sort of dragged into the Wave itself. Whereas with Etherpad, you just pass somebody the URL and you crack on. So it'll be another string to the bow I'm sure rather than just competing with Wave yeah and now people can set up their own Etherpad servers they're not dependent on a central service for it like they are with Wave well that was part of the attraction because I mean I know we do choice uh, but Gobby and Etherpad will effectively become very similar if you've got Mm. to set it up on your server then the appeal for me was the fact that it was at Etherpad and you didn't need to mess around with servers Mm, that's no hassle I guess Mm. Eben Moglen has written a blog post about the Oracle and Sun EU hearings, in which she says that the GPL itself is sufficient protection for MySQL and that the merger is no threat to it. Yeah, which is, I think, not what people were expecting him to say. Um, a lot of the EU, uh, a lot of the, uh, the contributions to the EU hearings have been about um, you know, Oracle being too big and they will anti-competitively squash MySQL and in favour of their big proprietary database and blah, 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 the world was going to end. Um, but what even Moglen says, and remembering he is a lawyer, so he, he's one of those people that doesn't have to put that, those five letters after, the, after his name, um, is that the GPL is, is fine. Um, I think what people are worrying about is whether there is um, enough industry support for a fork to make it commercially viable um, and he doesn't really address that so much because he's looking at it very much from a point of view of the source code and he's right the GPL does protect it in that respect in that respect great ABI research has published a paper that says that Linux has a 32 percent share of the network market and predicts that Linux will overtake Windows by 2013 Microsoft says that 93 percent of netbooks run Windows so those numbers don't quite add up hmm. Well, originally, presumably, Linux had 100% of the netbook market <laughs> and has then got back, gone back down to either 7% or 32%, depending on who num- whose numbers you believe. 
as a random sample of netbooks in this room. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this highly scientific, mutually uh, sampled audience. Go on. Linux has 100% a share 100%. of the netbook market. Let's write a report and publish it on the internet. I think that we should. Yeah, but nobody listens to stats because stats just prove you what you want them to prove. So, Very yeah, true. whatever. Bar humbug. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look at the events that are coming up. I'm looking, I'm looking. <laughs> oh, you want me to talk about it? Yes, right. please. Uh, 23rd of January is the Ubuntu user day. It's online in Hash Ubuntu... Um, Dash Classroom. Indeed. Around midday, or in fact, from midday onwards on the day. Okay, and uh, what's it about? The user day... Right, I'll read it. The user day is aimed at new users to Ubuntu and Linux and will cover topics such as switching to Ubuntu, how to get help, command line basics, and equivalent programs in Linux to what they may be used to in Windows or Mac OS. Cool, that sounds like a good idea. 23rd of January, hope it's a really good uh, event. And there is, of course, the one and only FOSDEM on the 6th or 7th of February 2010 at the University of Libra in good old Bursals. <laughs> it seems that our typo has crept back in again onto our little list of events. Do you think there's anyone on the planet who doesn't know when FOSDEM is now? Uh, I hope not. Basically, look at it this way. It'll be the last time we'll mention it because by the time we've come back, it will be over. Oh. But if you're going, you should tweet us at, or dent us at UUPC and say you're going and um, we can maybe we can, have a, we can have a tweet, tweet up. up. Yeah, and all the UUPC <laughs> listeners can buy us beer. We really should book the hotel. Yeah, well, actually, we should establish whether we're going yet. That's the, that's yeah. the, and how are we going to get there? If they don't sort the trains out, yeah, that's oh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe they need to knit a, a giant scarf for the Eurostar. It's the Southern California Linux Expo on the 19th to 21st of February. And we have a trailer. Whether you've only heard of Linux or if you're an expert, here's your chance to learn more about it at the Southern California Linux Expo. For 2010, Scale has expanded to five speaker tracks. The Expo now includes a beginner's track for those new to Linux and a developer's track for the coders out there. Scale will have over 50 speakers who will cover the latest topics in open source, and the Expo floor will have over 80 booths with both commercial and non-profit organizations showing off their products and software. The Southern California Linux Expo is February 19th, 20th, and 21st, 2010 at the Westin LAX Hotel in Los Angeles. For more information or to register for the Expo, visit SoCalLinuxExpo.org. Use promo code CAST, C-A-S-T, for 40% off of your registration. We'll see you at Scale Apex. Wow. Well, I think it was great of status quo to do the backing music for that. <laughs> Pretty impressive. I'm surprised they were available. But anyway, um, yeah, that sounds good. And um, that's about it for the events. It's traditional at this time of year to predict what's going to happen in the coming 12 months. I, I know... This, you know, the other shows do the same sort of thing so apparently it's the law we have to do it as well <laughs> <laughs> um, so what have your highlights been from the last year what do you think you'll see next year um, or what would you like to see happen Laura uh, I it's not so much a prediction as a kind of wish list idea okay, go for it in that a lot of people have whinged about sound on Linux mm -hmm. um, myself included um, and I think it'd be really good for Ubuntu if Canonical would sponsor a project to draw it all together, to make it work, whatever needs doing, um, sort of put some muscle behind it and really just drag it into shape and get it working. Do you think that's one of the problems at the moment is that it's a bit disparate? Um, I don't actually know what the problems are at the moment. Mm. Um, but I think I, I get the impression there's lots of different bits of projects and mm. or things just don't hook together i know when i look at the sound settings i've no idea what i'm selecting it's just trial and error and i think if canonical it may be not a money issue so much as just having somebody specifically focus on it yeah i don't know whether other distros have the same sort of problem as as that but it it, it is a big thing you just thought they must do but and, th and they certainly have thrown um investment at other places, you know, specifically targeted in, in the in previous releases. So, yeah, I can see that happening. Oh, it's massive, isn't it? Mm. I mean, if you a new user coming to Ubuntu and you load it up, even if it's just a live CD, and your sound doesn't work, mm. that disc's going in the bin. It mm. really needs to be fixed. And it's not just sort of the out-of-box sound. It's when you start one application and then you start another application and then another application says, oh, I can't use sound because it's being used by something else. It's like, I don't care, just make it work. <laughs> that kind of slickness we need okay cool 
Go on then, Simon. What? <laughs> I'm sat wreck my brain. To you. <laughs> yeah. Um, you seem quite confident before. I am confident about next year. I think um, it certainly isn't going to be the uh, the year of the Linux desktop, <laughs> uh, which we've just been chuckling about. But I think it probably will be more of the year of the Linux phone. We've certainly Linux seen phone, that this year. You know, Android yeah. is um, is forging ahead, and I'm desperate to get my hero. Um, <clears throat> but I think uh, so. I think we're going to see more of Linux mm. phones on the market. Well, Google have got their new phone yeah, due out next year, January, isn't it? It's yeah, I think it's early. Yeah, I don't know. If it's going to reach the UK in January, but apparently they were giving them out at Google in um, <sighs> San Francisco to Googlers. Really? Yeah, cool. uh, unlocked as well. Um, I know they've been talking to Vodafone and uh, one of the other networks, Orange, I think, in the Yay. UK. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully it's not going to be a, an iPhone job where it's only on one oh, or two networks. I think that ridiculous. should be illegal. Um, well, it was, a, yeah, it was a big money machine, wasn't it? But, it is, oh, but it's Monopoly. You know? oh, yeah. I don't, don't like it. <laughs> for me, I think that my wish for next year would be um, more advocacy. To see Linux okay. um, seen by more of the population, for them, them to understand what it is, not necessarily Ubuntu, although you know, more people see Linux and they're going to go straight to Ubuntu. That is the distro of choice, of course. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> but I just want a, more of the general public to uh, to see uh, Linux and, and not just the, the geeks and the nerds. Obviously, we've seen it on the BBC this year. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more of that. Yeah, okay, cool. Have we um, anything from the uh, the Twitter sphere or the uh, Identica? No, the one that you said about the year of the Linux desktop uh, was uh, from Open Sorcerer. Elliot JH says less visible Linux on the netbook, but more around in general devices that run Linux but don't show it, like smartphones and simplified netbooks. Uh, that's his predict- prediction. Liam GH says it would be great to see more machines with Ubuntu pre-installed. Would really help get new people into Linux. Yep, mm-hmm. good sure. idea. Uh, so William says more games, open source or not, will run on Linux. He says, "I hope." Oh, interesting. So yeah, <laughs> Techno Viking says twenty ten will be the year of the Linux desktop. No, oh. really, <laughs> honest this time. Yes, first of many people saying the same thing. I suspect. <laughs> yes. And Pyrus on Identica says, I hope the clever folks could sort out the flash and sound issues on Linux. Where are those clever folks when you need them, eh? Yeah. And joining us on the phone from Snowy Farnborough is uh, Sir Alan of Pope. Do you know, I'd love it if it really was snowy. Uh, but it's oh, right. not. It's just slippery and icy and horrible. Oh, yeah. that makes it sound miserable. Have you got mince pies there? Uh, no. Oh, oh, yes. Yes, I oh. have. Yeah, a package from the Transvaal arrived today and... Oh. Uh, have mince pies yet. Did you have homemade brandy butter? I haven't yet. Oh, man. <laughs> you've missed it. We have. But, yeah, so we're very sorry you couldn't be down here, but you've got some um, predictions or something for us, I think. Yeah, I, 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 um, I noticed um, Simon said that uh, he expected next year to be the kind of year of the Linux phone rather than, you know, the year of the Linux desktop that everyone keeps saying. Yeah. But I reckon it's going to be more the netbook. I think we're going to see more and more of these netbooks, both x86 Intel architecture and ARM, and the fact that the sales figures you mentioned in the news talk mm. about, say, 30% of total PC sales is netbooks, and of that, 30% are Linux, it says to me we've got a good 10% of the market, and I think we're going to grow from there. Yeah, cool. ARM will uh, will certainly help that, won't it, with the um, the battery life that they're predicting. Yeah, that and process. the fact that the, the only other option, if you if you've got an ARM. The only other operating system you can put on there, if it's not Linux, is going to be Windows CE, or I guess Android, perhaps. Cool. So, are you prepared to put your money where your mouth is and come up with a number? A what, number of what? what, what a um, percentage of the market will have this time next year? More than ten percent. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, uh, that's a very loose number, isn't it? Well, I don't know. Everyone else says we've got like less than one percent. I reckon it's going to be more than ten percent. Cool. That's fair enough. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so have you got any particular highlights from the from the last year? Um, yeah, well, what, in terms of podcasting or... Yeah, whatever. Linux, everything. open source, which UDS or something like that. Yeah, I, I quite enjoyed UDS this time. I think I found it more enjoyable than the previous UDSs because I think more got done. Hmm. And I think as a result of... Um, it was a more aggressive schedule at UDS. So I think Lucid is going to be the Lucid Lynx um, 1004 is going to be pretty good. Uh, from from what I've seen of just the plans of, mm. of 
ten oh four. I think that's going to be pretty good, but I still don't think it's enough to sway a lot of people. I still think there's going to be plenty of people out there who um, still disregard Ubuntu as a as an option. And I think we still just have to keep plugging away and you know chipping away at those people and and trying our best. You know, not ramming it down their throat, but you know, just letting them know that we're still here and we're still putting out a release every six months. I think last year was good. Maybe we could have done some things better. As Laura said, perhaps sound could have been better. You know, we have a few issues with the <laughs> Linux desktop. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think we're getting better. And do you know if um, GNOME 3 is going to be uh, in Lucid and whether it'll have a, a big Unlikely. impact? Unlikely. Right, OK. I, I know, um, I think in the news you mentioned that Mark Shuttleworth has step down and yeah. isn't taking more a design role. I believe he's doing some major, or involved in doing some major redesign of the GNOME panel. Okay. Um, so they may be taking cues from uh, GNOME 3, or you know, taking elements that are in the design of GNOME 3 mm. and, and all part of this Ayatana project. But I, I don't see getting a whole new desktop. The GNOME 3 look and feel will be something we'll get anytime soon, because this is a long-term support release, and I don't think yeah. it's ready for that. Cool. Well, thank Plus, you. One other thing, oh, actually, I should say, about last year, of course, Og Camp. Oh, yes. Our very own Og Camp. Yeah, that was going to be one of my highlights. Oh. No, 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 that's fine. We can share it. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> can another... share too? Well, tell, tell me, Tony, you tell me mm. about your highlight of this year. <laughs> um, well, I was going to say Og Camp, uh, okay. as, long as, as long as you don't mind. Um, yeah, no, it was... It was uh, a lot of hard work, but it really did pay off. And still, the the the, the memory of nipping down to the hotel room and, and coming back out of the hotel room and seeing the queue was was stretching three floors down around these big sort of spiral stairs. Um, it was quite frightening and a little bit overwhelming. And uh, but it was great to know that people were actually going to show up, and they're all really yeah, it's good keen. Validation, really, for the fact that you yeah, know, put it all together, and actually, people do want to come to an event like that. Yeah, yeah, and I but I never thought that we would be in a position that we were organising that sort of event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, us as in, as in all individuals with the, uh, the Linux Outlaws guys as well. Yeah. It was strangely satisfying, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was, and quite scary. Yeah. You know, there were a number of times that we, all of us, looked at each other um, as if to say, oh my God, is this really happening? <laughs> yeah, uh, your scare metre sort of went up throughout the day Saturday and then increased overnight if i remember <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, until yeah. it reached some sort of some sort of uh, hiatus of midday on sunday <laughs> yeah about the time when my laptop decided to give up the ghost yeah <laughs> yeah yeah next year we'll do it better but um yeah no it was really great and uh Sorry, it, did you say next year uh yeah, yeah. So are you talking about odd camp next year yeah yeah we oh. i don't think it's i don't think it's unfair to say that we're we are in the early stages of discussions about what odd camp next year might be excellent yeah but yeah, cool. Well, thank you for phoning in with your uh, your uh, predictions and highlights. That's okay. Sorry I can't be there, and thanks for taking over. I think that's one of the things that we have got right in this podcast, is that even if um, now 20% <laughs> of us don't turn up, I'm trying to do the math, Yeah, 20% of us don't turn up, yeah. it still works. 20, 40, I think it was 40% kinda, technically at the moment. We kind of rely on 20% not turning up, really. Yeah. <laughs> What, so there's enough cups? For yeah, to I tweet all your mince pies as well. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Yeah, um, it was, uh, we were at a, uh, a Christmas party on um, Saturday <laughs> night, and um, a, a friend of ours referred to the show as uh, Tony and Laura's podcast. Um, in front of Alan. In front of Alan. <laughs> uh, uh, and normally it tends to be Popey's podcast. Yeah, um, previously she was quite a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> I really like her. I think she's great. I think I she's, she's very her. sensible, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're not going to let you forget that one in a hurry, that's for sure. <laughs> no. No, I'll be reminded of that. <laughs> okay, mate. Well, go enjoy the rest of your evening. And yeah. uh, thanks for dialing in. Yeah, and have a good Christmas. Yeah. yeah. Cheers, yeah, mate. mate. Cheers, bye. See ya. I think the uh, highlight for me was probably seeing those queues of people down the stairs in a dog camp at sort of 10 o'clock in the morning, was it? And not having seen anybody and then all of a sudden having to push my way back up through the, the crowds of people. Uh, but then also the live raffle at the... Uh, <laughs> I think the oh. raffle was everybody's highlight last year. I think, yeah. Do you know I've not listened back to it? I, I started listening to it and I thought I can't, I can't <laughs> possibly, and I still haven't listened to the to we, the raffle. We listened <laughs> back to it, and I actually said at the end, I surprisingly found that really amusing. Yeah, I, know, I remember. Um, I don't think it's portraying any confidence. Is that Jono and Ak turned to each other part way through and said, "They're not being rude to the people who won." 
<laughs> and going, it's a different show. They're not us. <laughs> but yes, um, yeah, no, the raffle was, was quite a highlight for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, maybe that's something else we're going to see more of, more and more shows. Open um, source obviously, raffles. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the raffle podcast. <laughs> raffle cast. <laughs> Yeah, but more and more people, as more and more people start using it. I mean, I'm into running, and there are mm. just hundreds of running podcasts. Mm. Maybe we're going to see more and more Linux podcasts. Obviously, you know, Shot of Jack's out now. Yep. Maybe we're going to see other people jumping on that bandwagon as well. Yeah, I, I think I think my prediction is that we will see a, a short-form podcast um, coming out of the UK very soon in the next couple of months. What, um, Shots of Jack? Not a Shot of Jack, no, but something sort of, you know, another, same sort of idea. Another Bo- shotcast, yeah. A little bite-sized podcast, yeah. yeah That's my know, prediction. You know something mm. we don't. No, don't I know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Quite he might know that. Yes. Oh, well, well you have to uh, join, uh, join us again in December 2010 to see how many of these predictions we got right and, uh, and yeah. see what we think will happen in 2011. <laughs> This is the bit about Ubuntu. Let's call it Bauble. Should we call it Bauble or Ru- Rudolph? <laughs> call it Rudolph this time. Anyway. As currently only Tomboy and Evolution sync up with uh, Ubuntu One, Ars Technica have provided a code tutorial for how to make your application sync with it. Yeah. Uh, if you want to sort of start making your application network aware and, and to be able to share your data between multiple different machines, um, it's a good place to start as a bit of a tutorial to get you going, I think. When you say data, do you mean the configuration files of the applications or the data itself? Well, with Tomboy, it's the data itself that's shared, isn't it? So you have your Tomboy notes available on all of your different machines and they're automatically synced. I shoot. What what would the equivalent maybe that you see the address books on Evolution? That sort of yeah, thing. I assume everything other than the mail bit, I guess. Yeah. But maybe you can show your whole mail store, I don't know. Yeah. But can you save your configurations of all your separate applications? That must be part of this as well. You must, or rather... Your preferences and things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I know that Ubuntu have only really just started on the applications they want to port to it, but maybe you're a third-party person and would like to get started. It's all about couch DB and, and things, and I know I see Stuart Language tweet about it all the time. And he <laughs> seems to like it. I can't pretend to understand it. <laughs> Microsoft have released an open source version of Silverlight. It's actually called Silver to- Silverlight 2, which they developed in cooperation with Novell. Um, so it'll enable you to watch uh, unencrypted uh, broadcasts that using using Silverlight on Linux and on Ubuntu. It's going to be available and packaged for Ubuntu, so you can watch things like the Winter Olympics. So what happens to the uh, other project? That's a good question. Moonlight. I don't know. Uh, Moonlight, yes. Well, I, I suspect that, I mean, Moonlight was, I think, developed at least partly by Novell anyway. So I suspect that they may be quite similar. I don't know whether they actually share any code, but, you know. Um, but, yeah, so there's no DRM engine, though, still. So you still can't watch things like Netflix and, and other pro- services that stream Silverlight stuff using uh, in DRM on them. But, you know, hey, it's a good start. And it's a genuine open source app from Microsoft. It appears that there's been some progress on uh, native multi-touch support uh, for Linux. The uh, the team at ENAC, the Interactive Computer Laboratory, have uh, released a video of um, of some pretty funky stuff going on with uh, with multi-touch. Yeah, so go on, explain what you mean by multi-touch then. If you have a touch screen, mm-hmm. you can obviously do things by putting your finger on the screen or a stylus and, and yep. interacting directly onto the screen. With multi-touch, you can use two. So you can grab a document... Two with- screens or... With two, <laughs> two fingers. <laughs> you probably could do it with two screens, actually. But no, two fingers. So you could grab a document with two fingers and interact spin with it. it. Spin it, okay. move it, drag it. Um, the more typical application of it is like in adverts where you get a photograph and zoom in using it by dragging your fingers apart. So this will help Linux make better adverts? Yes. <laughs> so this is the sort of thing, am I right, that the iPods had for a while? Uh, iPhone does iPhone, it. Sorry, um, right. And I guess... If there's anything else touchscreeny in Macs, and the big win, the big Microsoft um, touchscreen desktop thing, table thing, table things. Okay, so this is Linux. Linux catching up, then, is it? Mm, maybe mm. it'll be an Android. Oh yeah, or, uh, catching up or forging ahead. I mean, it's on other computers. I mean, I don't really consider the iPhone to be a computer; it's a phone. Yeah. Okay. But you know, is this the first sort of um, laptop stroke, in theory, desktop that you can do multi-touch on? 
I don't know, but you are, I mean, you are seeing more devices with a touchscreen built in these days, sort of small form laptops, that sort of thing. Yep. Does it take special uh, hardware to do multi-touch over ordinary touch, though? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. Right now, it just appears to work on a certain amount of um, hardware, um, which is uh, listed, listed on the website. But, of course, once it gets out there, then other um, vendors will develop it for their um, for their own hardware, hopefully. Yeah. Mm. No, that would be cool. And and it could really help bring things like Mirko Muller's low-fat project they did all those years ago yeah. up to, um, you know, it'll finally give you an interface to be able to use that sort of interface properly. If you sort of mean, I said interface twice, but you know what I mean. It'll give yeah. you the ability to use that sort of interface to its fullest uh, extent. That's good. That'd be good. I mean, are we moving away from... Um, I'm a, a great believer in keeping your hands on the keyboard rather mm. than faffing around with a mouse or a trackpad. But with this sort of stuff, we now get to the point where we're going to get rid of the keyboard and just do it all on the screen. I think it's about finding the right application for it um, because on I've got a touchscreen phone now and it's really cool for some things. <clears throat> like you can do, if you're looking at photos, you can whiz them along by just dragging your finger across the screen, which is actually quite nice um, to do. But when you're typing in it, I use the on-screen um, phone keypad but you have to click through about two or three times to get up to a screen where it'll actually let you enter text yeah uh, when it'd be a lot easier just to have a hardware keyboard at that point and just type and it would appear on the same screen if you can get up to the same sort of typing speed on a an on-screen keyboard that you do on a hardware keyboard my son's got the same phone and he is lightning fast yeah so i suppose as you say it just depends what you are you're used mm. to yeah mm, good stuff uh the ubuntu forums dot org facts have been published um i'm not going to read them all out but basically there's a whole list of different stats um, about the traffic that ubuntu forums gets and uh, some of the headlines are that they get fourteen thousand new accounts each month which is a lot twenty two thousand mm. new threads a month yeah and presumably they can't all be spam <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that's really good. Uh, 13, uh, 3.7 million visits each month. And uh, unsurprisingly, 74% of visitors use Firefox. 35% of visitors use Windows. Yeah, that is quite surprising. Quite interesting. Yeah. Maybe people have broken their Ubuntu systems, go onto the forums <laughs> to get help, but have to use their backup window system to help them out. But yeah, so it's good to know that the forums are really alive and thriving and getting a whole heap of new users every month. That presumably means more people are using Ubuntu. Dell are about to release uh, another version of the Inspiron Mini 10, uh, this time with the new Intel Atom N450 processor. Yeah, which is up at 1.6 gig, as I understand. Um, and it comes with, a, I think it's a nine-cell battery, sorry, a, a battery that's supposed to do nine and a half hours of life. Now, and you always really? a bit wary about battery stats from manufacturers, but that's still quite a good battery life. That's impressive. Even if it's only sort of two-thirds of that, that's pretty good going. Um, and, and most importantly, of course... It comes in lots of different colours. <laughs> ah, yes. So it does. It looks really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, it also comes with an HDD, HDTV tuner and location-aware GPS. Nice. Or, or will do. Um, Ooh, really? Of, yeah. Ooh, I want one. Mm. Yeah. I'm in the market for a new laptop, actually. I may have to hold off. You are now. It's got Bluetooth. Yep. Um, and we'll do HD play. But there's an HD screen version coming, which is 1366 by 768 so you'll be able to play back movies and stuff at reasonably high definition. Not 100% high def, but, you know, pretty good. Ah, it says here, the battery, you get a choice of three or a six cell battery. Ah, that'll be the six cell then. That is the, the six the cell, but that's with the mobility bundle, so that's an extra. And uh, it does set the top that you don't get the bulgy back end for that, but I'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nothing worse than a bulgy back Nothing. end. <laughs> and the best news is, of course, is that they come with ubuntu yay or windows, windows xp 7. <laughs> or windows 7 but they also come with ubuntu so that's great that's great to see that actually they are keeping the ubuntu part of that of that mm. market going it's good to see yeah yeah yeah. they look really cool and the free culture showcase is to get a new set of judges for the next round tony's been sacked <laughs> yeah but- <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yes. And and everybody else who's judged as well. Um, no, no. Um, very nice email from Daniel Holbach saying that just to kind of make things a bit different, stir it up every uh, the next round, they're going to find a new set of judges. Keep so, things fresh. Absolutely. It's a good idea. And I'm not at all hurt, wounded and betrayed. Does this mean you can now <laughs> contribute? I guess oh, it does. Yeah. yeah. I suppose there's, there's no excuse not to now. That's a bad... <laughs> thank you, Simon. It's yeah. snowing outside. How we go tomorrow morning, get some photographs taken. Make a nice big Ubuntu logo in the snow. <gasps> Actually, no, no. <laughs> I've got essays to write. <laughs> and that's 
all that's in the bit about Ubuntu this time. And it's time for some feedback. Roger Light emailed. I thought you might like to know that I've just put a release of my app Mosquito, an open source MQTT broker, online at mosquito.achu.org. I thought you might be interested because it came about as a direct consequence of Andy Stanford Clark's talk on MQTT and his Twittering house at OGCamp. This is something that might not have existed if not for you. So thanks for organising OGCamp and I hope this goes some way to persuading you to organise it again next year. That is really cool. Very yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. I'm so proud. And if you have a look at the mum pages, we've actually got a thank you at the end of each mum page. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so for those who weren't at Og Camp, um, we're supposed to do, um, mm. we have talked to Andy in the past, back in season one, but essentially the MQTT broker was the only bit of proprietary software in the middle of his whole of his tweeting house thing, um, so, yeah. which was uh, his electricity meter tweeted and his mouse traps tweeted and all this other stuff so was able to tweet and tell him information about what was going on in his house and at Og camp he said it's the only bit of proprietary thing in there and roger obviously went off and wrote an open source implementation of it good man because the standard is open and he did it like within days pretty much yeah yeah we he emailed a couple of weeks ago and we forgot to include it in the last episode so sorry about that roger but um yeah it's a really great project and uh, hopefully he can get some um you know get some really good use out of it and if you're interested go along to the website and uh, Linux format number 127 has also had a bit of a write-up of OGCamp, and they're trying to encourage us to run it again next year um, in order to take over from Lug Radio Live. Now, that's not going to happen next year. Which, again, I think is really nice of them, because yeah. that was just out of the blue, wasn't it? That's very good. Yeah, yeah, we, we hadn't bribed them or anything. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't write the article ourselves either. No. But yeah, thanks, guys. It's going to happen. Yeah. Chris Blower's email to criticise our voicemail service. Why, oh why, do you have an 0845 number for the show? You preach free software, but ask listeners to make a a usually non-free phone call to leave messages. Is this deliberate? If not, could you please provide the landline equivalent, or at least add it to um, say no to 0870.com? That way you should get more people phoning up. I still don't get the controversy around this 0845 thing. It's something to do with the charges to call an 0845 right, number. An 0845 number is meant to be local. local so you local should call. get um, local rate charges. But if you ring it, I think if you ring it from a mobile, it costs you oh. more. And of course, all of us use our free call allocation and you'd in fact pay for it if you did it on your mobile. Yeah, or something, something like, like that. that. Anyway, basically, it, it tends to cost more than just calling a direct... Uh, landline number but of course it isn't a landline number for us it's a sip service um that, right. that they know that alan set up i think yeah he did um and anyway he's taken flack for it ever yeah since. absolutely <laughs> dave and alan have a bit of a ding dong about it every so often and i'm sure um one day somebody will set up an alternative one well it's <laughs> being done right now i know ah. that davy um being the asterisk guru that he is is setting up uh, a second number so we'll have Ooh, cool. Okay, well, um, we probably won't have the details for that to be included in this episode, but hopefully we'll have it for next season. I'm sure Davey is on the case. <coughs> Cafe Ninja emailed in in response to our coverage of Google's DNS service. Where I live in Italy, and I be- and where you live too in the UK, I believe that the police and other enforcement agencies have a de- daily script which DNS blacklist demands. All national ISPs must, by law, subscribe to that script and cannot elect to not participate. This has all been done in the name of protecting the kids from porn. So when some government official, highly qualified to be sure, puts wikipedia.com in there to protect the children from album art from the band The Scorpions, the entire service is unavailable. Where here in Italy it's been proven that they block even politically sensitive sites that are critical of the government. So in my home we use OpenDNS, not just for the content filtering for the kids, but to make sure that the content isn't broken or hidden from us for political and commercial reasons. Honestly, I trust the crowdsourcing ratings for, of inappropriate material from OpenDNS much more than the State Police of Italy. Didn't know about that. No, no. Well, I knew such things did exist because... Oh, sorry about that. I knew just such things did exist because I remember us talking about it last season when the Wikipedia thing happened, but it wasn't all ISPs by any stretch. So I don't know um, I don't know quite what the legal details of that is. But yeah, that that was a case of, of them adding a, a domain, in this case Wikipedia, to a, to a block list and nobody could access it. Whilst you may use the DNS, the sites can still be blocked at an ISP level, can't they? So yeah. whether you use DNS or not. Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's a number of different other ways to sp- stop somebody getting access to a site, even if they're not using your DNS service. Yeah. 
you know, block it by destination IP and all sorts of things. Um, but I guess DNS is probably a, a quite a cheap and easy way to do it. Yeah, sure. Matt Cop dented us to ask. Was Tony wearing a bell on a collar in the last episode? It seems like every time he spoke, he started jingling. Kind of festive. No, I didn't have my bell on during the last recording <laughs> session. Um, <laughs> he had I, his I, tail on, though. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, basically, we have two cats that live here with us, and um, sometimes they like to get involved in the recording. Become podcats. Become podcats, yeah. And they both wear collars. Um, but I do have some bells. Um, that's real jingle bells. Okay. Just to the Christmas, <laughs> Christmas flavour. But yeah, so no, generally the jingling is the cats. Simon Weir's what wrote in. In regards to you all saying about slipping in the free software song last episode, I think you should finish the season with all with you all singing the free software song. If you don't, I'll be sad. Well, prepare to be sad, Simon, because <laughs> we ain't doing it. <laughs> I don't even know it. Uh, it uh, you don't want to. You better. I've heard off. it very briefly somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry, Simon. No way. And uh, Ashley Rolf from Viglan has let us know that the famous Viglan MPCL offer is still on and likely to run till March next year. So if you want to get your hands on a tiny Linux box for £79, download Season 1, Episode 11, and find out all the details. How many downloads have we got of that now? It's ridiculous. Just isn't tipping it? Uh, 30,000 on that. <laughs> <laughs> Compared with? Uh, well, some of the other ones in that uh, season are about the same as well, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah it's just it's, it's slightly further ahead than the others. <laughs> if they've sold 30,000 big <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> I think we'd be on, uh, sitting in our gold-plated studio by that point, wouldn't we? If they had. We're not getting a cut. Well, no, I know, but you know they might buy us one. <laughs> and finally, Josh Holland sent us a quick voicemail. Hi, all. This is uh, Josh Holland, or Dutchy, wishing everybody a happy Christmas or whatever seasonal holiday you're on this year. Thanks. Oh, oh thanks, Josh. Thanks, thanks, Josh. Have a good one yourself. And that's the end of your feedback. That's it. The end of the year. <laughs> the end of the season. It is nigh. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening and thanks to everyone who took part via Twitter and Identica. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can leave us a voicemail in a number of ways. Telephone 0845 508 1986 or VoIP podcast at sip.ubuntu-uk.org. And finally, you can Skype using Ubuntu UK Podcast. You can send us your comments and get updates from recording sessions on Identica or Twitter, where we are at UUPC. Alternatively, if you're into RC, you can chat to us uh, via the hash ubuntu-uk-podcast <laughs> <laughs> on the Freenode RC network. Join our Facebook fan page, search for Ubuntu UK Podcast. We welcome suggestions, material, tips, reviews, rants, feedback, just a moment, or anything else you want to send us. Please do get in touch. Thanks also to our network of community mirrors listed on the website. Well, that really is a lot for this season. Uh, we had a great season, really enjoyed it, I think. And um, I just want to say a quick congratulations to Graham Bins, who we interviewed in a couple of previous episodes, who got married a couple of days ago. Congratulations to you. And uh, yeah, and thanks to uh, my well, our fellow presenters who are here and those who are not. <laughs> have you had a good one? Yeah, it's been fun this year. Cool. Yeah. We'll see you next season. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.